see what's happening here. Where do I see the live? Um, just scroll up on the video and okay. it should be showing up here and it's showing In the up. group. Yep. And we're live. There it Hello, is. Hello, Albert List, and welcome. We hope you're having a safe week out there amid this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, tonight, we're doing our weekly mock interview featuring Grace Ling, a rising senior at Santa Clara University. She's a computer science major and graduating soon into one of the most uncertain job markets in some time. Joining her is Corey, a senior, Corey Hiramoto, a, senior, a career advisor and founder at careershakers.com, which provides an array of coaching services and specializes in helping corporate professionals change jobs without going back to school. Combining his experience as a recruiter for a Fortune 5 company with his coaching background, he has helped clients find jobs that they, are, that they love and are proud of. From Hawaii, he was the first person in his family to leave the islands for college and attended Santa Clara University. He was the first undergraduate student from SCU to be hired directly into a management consulting advising Fortune 100, advising Fortune 100 companies on finance, accounting, corporate strategy, sales, and operations. Finding a passion for coaching and having an interest in career development, he changed careers, becoming a recruiter, and has been leveraging his expertise to help others do the same. And one of the coincidental things tonight is that we have three generations of Santa Clara University graduates. I graduated yeah. University yeah. in 2010. Go Broncos. graduated Santa Clara, I believe, in 2014. That's right. And Grace is about to graduate here in 2020. So if you're a Santa Clara graduate on the line, hit like, hit react. Uh, this is an all Bronco experience this evening. Go Broncos. <laughs> yeah, right. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, so tonight's rules are going to be really simple. Corey's going to go ahead and provide a mock interview. Uh, and Grace has provided her resume, which you see on the screen there, and also a job description that she has sent Corey in advance. Um, I'll be back intermittently to, con to conclude tonight's mock interview, and all of you who are watching right now can offer your thoughts, your feedback, and your questions. Uh, Corey, it's off to you, and I'm going to let you take it from here. Thank you. That was probably the most in-depth introduction I've gotten in a really long time. So that's perfect. I feel like Albert covered almost everything. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Hopefully we can show some great love and support for Grace, who's been an awesome or, or who will be an awesome volunteer for everyone. So I would love to see some support and love for Grace in the comments and the live feed. I have it up on my second computer here. So we'll be checking in probably after every question or so just to read the comments and see if I can help answer questions or, you know, ask other questions that you guys would find valuable. This is week number four, I believe, of our mock interview sessions. We've gone four weeks in a row, which is awesome. The first week, um, I did a practice session with someone trying to get into product management. Um, it was with Jen Monique. I'm just giving you guys names. So if you guys want to search through Albert's list to find the recordings later on. The first session was with Jen Monique for a product manager role. If you are looking to maybe explain a gap in work history, if you're trying to re-enter the workforce, we covered some tips and tricks on that. In the second session, uh, I was working with Zach and he is a site reliability engineer or IT engineer. So if you're looking at those fields and we covered two major topics with his background. The first is explaining some frequent job moves. Like if you've changed companies maybe every year or every year and a half and also moving from an individual contributor role and trying to apply for a manager role where you would manage a team. We covered those topics in that second session. And then last week we covered nonprofit moves to a corporate environment. So um, you guys can check that one out. It was related to marketing or event marketing, to, to be more specific. And for those folks who are interested in entering the nonprofit space, which I think is a really, really interesting field right now, um, at the end of that video, La Renee actually gave some really good tips about how to actually make that transition into non nonprofit if you don't have any direct experience. So feel free to check that one out. And now I will kick it over to Grace, our brave and fantastic volunteer, to give maybe like a quick little introduction, talk a little bit about your roles that you're applying for and what types of companies you may be interested in. That way, if anyone in the community knows somebody or maybe even works at those companies, you can uh, get some great connections that way. Yeah, so I'm Grace. I'm currently a master's student at Santa Clara University studying computer science and engineering. 
Uh, my bachelor's was actually in bioengineering because I used to be pre-med, um, but growing up, I actually really loved drawing and designing games. So kind of, coming, kind of going back to my childhood roots, I recently took on more design projects and then now started to do design. Um, so I also have a side hustle of social media. So I actually have over 35,000 followers on social media. I really love doing art and have an art business and doing a lifestyle blog. So combining my interest in design and also my social media background, I'm very passionate about um, designing positive experiences for people on social media, especially social media, tech and gaming are the industries I'm personally interested in. And my skills are in UI, UX and product design. Awesome, awesome. I have to refresh my feed here. Do you want to put in the uh, in the Facebook feed, maybe like some of your social links, just so if, yeah. if folks want to be a part of your community or check out some of the the work that you've done, I think that'd be really awesome. You said thirty five thousand. That's impressive. Yeah, I put it? Yeah, I used to do a lot of collaborations with businesses to do like sponsored posts, um, kind of collaborate giveaways and food reviews. It was really fun side hustle of mine in high school. It all started with a running blog, actually. I was actually um, major cro a really fast cross country and track runner in high school. I hold all my school records, went to nationals a couple of times. And um, that's kind of how I got a lot of followers on my blog is from my running career. And then now I, I don't run competitively anymore, but I decided to, I learned a lot from running about a lot of like endurance and I it kind of applies to my everyday life. So I kind of post more about lifestyle, healthy living, um and art now on my blog i love that I, I love it that's awesome Thank you. you can clearly tell that 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 grace loves to stay busy she has a lot going on and juggling all at the same time and i also love the entrepreneurial spirit which is great so yeah if you want to pin a comment or a um uh i guess you can write it in the chat for folks who want to check out your website and things like that that would be awesome in the meantime, while you were doing that, we will highlight the role that we're going to do this mock interview on. So in Grace's introduction, she talked a little bit about what she's looking at. So she is looking for like UI, UX entry level roles when she finishes her master's program next year, right? January, or it should be January 2021. Yeah, or June, June 2021. Um, so we are showcasing this role from Facebook, you know, not my favorite company, but, you know, we can talk about that later. Um, uh, so as we highlight this job, um, this is for, they, they call it a product designer role. Um, it's, it's a sample role. It, it does say London, UK, but this is just something we wanted to have up on screen so folks can follow along and track with us. Um, so that is the role that we'll be highlighting. Did you want to give any other context about maybe why you chose this role or what particular industries besides gaming you're interested in? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess um, I'll kind of share a little more context. So growing up, I've actually, so I was born and raised in San Jose, California. I love to draw, kind of create comics and do storytelling, love to draw manga. And then because of my cross country and track background, I was very interested in medicine. Um, so it, I was a bioengineering major coming into college. I really wanted to be an MD, PhD and a neurosurgeon, kind of examining neuroscience and artificial intelligence and now how that relates to reducing pain felt when running. So I wanted to optimize myself to run faster. And I also ran a blog. So that's why I'm really interested in social media, especially because I have a lot of experience with it and a lot of positive encounters on social media. So I feel like applying my skills in design to experience a more positive environmental people will be very helpful. Um, however, kind of halfway through college, I really missed creativity, um, kind of creativity in a space where I can kind of, without creating products, without the restrictions of biology, because I actually worked in a research lab um, during, doing a kind of gene therapy using exosomes, which are extracellular vesicles to do, to couple them together with genes to do gene therapy with the professor, um, kind of like missing creativity and the fact that because bioengineering, there's a lot of restrictions to biology limits. So I kind of really missed that. And then the, during my junior year at Santa Clara University, a virtual reality lab opened up at my school. So I kind of really learned how to create my own VR games. And I watched a lot of YouTube tutorials to learn how to make VR. And I really love VR because it there's like so many kind of elements of creativity to it. You can really do a lot, almost anything with it because there's so many degrees of freedom and a lot of resources available online. So I kind of fell in love with the VR. 
Um, so after creating my own VR game, it's on my resume too. It's called Selfie, C-E-L-L-F-I-E, where you become a cell in VR. It's pronounced Selfie, like you're taking a selfie for social media and by my social media background. Thank you. I really love the process of kind of gamifying things, like gamifying processes, because I was so interested in biology, but I love games growing up as well that my parents never really let me play. Um, so I decided to create my own games and decided to show my parents that games can be educational as well. Like, so my parents do. My parents do. Yeah, not a big fan of letting me play video games during the week. <laughs> yeah, same here. So I decided to show them. Yeah, games are actually really, really educational, uh, which led to my internship at Intuitive Surgical as a virtual reality robotic surgery game developer intern. And kind of from the processes of creating Selfie, I really got to make a product from start to end, starting from the concept art, prototyping, coding, a lot of coding, a lot of software engineering, user and user testing. I really decided that I really love the UX part of it. And that's what I decided to focus on. And then to do a surgical, I got to work with a lot of surgeons and also bioengineers and software engineers to create a product and really show my parents that games are not just for fun. They're very effective in training people in surgery, like even doctors. So they're kind of, that helped them understand like the other implications of gaming other than entertainment. And right now I'm doing my master's in computer engineering. And I decided to do computer engineering because I want to improve my technical skills because I want to be able to prototype my designs really quickly, be able to test them. However, after doing more hackathons as a designer, winning two this year um, and taking a 10 week digital product design course, I really discovered that I love design more than I do love coding. And that's kind of where I decided to focus my interest on. And with my side hustles of social media, creating communities online, I actually recently started a Design Buddies Discord server two and a half weeks ago with over 600 members now. And with my art business, I'm very interested in using my skills and creating dig positive digital experiences in social media, especially because it's impacting me so personally. And that is why I'm really interested in product design particular at Facebook. Oh my God, this was awesome. I love this. <laughs> I honestly, like I'm geeking out as like a career guru coach person, like for interview prep. I couldn't, I feel like this was one of the most polished um, and it wasn't even an interview question. I was literally just saying like, explain why you picked this role. And she basically turned it into a well rehearsed interview question, which is fantastic. And I'm just smiling because I feel like a lot of people are gonna get really good value from our session tonight. As you can tell, Grace is very, very polished. Um, so I guess, and this is not an, an, an interview question. Why don't we give some folks a little bit of insights um how did you i guess how do you or how did you prepare for interviews because it clearly seems like you've done a lot of homework and prep for this so maybe some folks can take in and learn from how how you went about doing it yeah so i actually didn't do that many interviews compared to a lot of people um because past in the past of my freshman sophomore junior year i've actually worked in academia so i did a lot of research with professors so interviewing for academia roles is, is really different than interviewing for industry roles so i've actually had my first ever interview for a job in my life during my junior year of college it was um, october 2018 and that was my first company I interviewed with was actually facebook and that was very, it was a very great learning experience. I actually made it to the final round. Um, however, I think I was lucky in experience because I actually started design um, like a few months ago, but I was able to make it that far, which gave me a lot of hope and enthusiasm. And the next interview I had was with Intuitive Surgical, the company I interviewed at. And it was actually really interesting because I only had half the qualifications on the job description, but I was able to get the job. and. And I, because I was able to kind of demonstrate my willingness to learn and uh, like really ability, ability to work well on the team and staying humble. So I feel like that gave me a huge confidence boost in interviewing. And this year, unfortunately, I've, I've done about five or six interviews, but they've all been canceled due to COVID-19. So right now I'm trying to do as many informational interviews as well with people, kind of seeing what questions they ask um, and how they answer it and kind of take it away from it and kind of apply it to my own life. And that's why I'm here today, trying to improve my interview skills even more. Love it. So basically what Grace is saying is she's a total natural and she didn't do any preparation at all before doing these interviews. Um, but one thing that I think she was a little too bashful to admit, which we talked about before we started recording this live session is Grace actually puts herself 
in a lot of, I would say, uncomfortable situations for herself to push her and help her grow. Uh, she said normally she's not comfortable in front of large audiences or, or speaking with, with strangers, um, but she's actually made a conscious effort to work on that and improve. And so she's been organizing meetups, like very large meetups, in fact, with almost 100 people attending at a time and organizing like online study sessions and things like that. So I think even indirectly by putting herself in these situations and also forcing herself to probably give her elevator pitch multiple times, right? Or explain what she does and why she's doing it or convince people to come to her meetup events or to participate. I feel like that also kind of builds some soft skills, which as you can tell here are clearly shining as we haven't even started mock interview Thank prep you. yet. So I'm super excited to get this started. Um, just to recap for folks who may have joined, um, Grace is a graduating, uh, I should say graduating master's student um, in about a year-ish or so. Um, so if you guys have any insights or tips for her as she's trying to, to get into UX or um, UI design, um, and are you looking for internships potentially this summer? Is that what you, what, kind of what you're targeting? Yes, my if internship possible? is act yes, possible this summer because um, my okay. internship is actually canceled. Um, but also prepare taking this time in case nothing happens, I prepare for full-time roles in the fall. Perfect. Love it. Love it. Now, um, just a quick plug, um, just from a recruiter perspective, from Grace's resume, this is one of the most action-packed and um, busy, but in a good way, in, uh, resumes that I've seen in a very long time from a recent college graduate. Just some things to highlight really, really quickly that were very evident. Um, she has both a major and minor and she's also now getting a master's degree in a somewhat different field, which is already standing out. And she does put this at the very top of her resume. So she's trying to draw my attention to her educational background. And of course she went to Santa Clara University, which is a phenomenal school, no bias here at all. Um, she does highlight her skills, which is great. She has a lot of relevant experience. I mean, I can literally highlight almost all of this. And she was doing it while in school, which is also very, very impressive. As you can tell, she's been doing some of this stuff ever since she's been in school or while at school at the same time. And right away, like I noticed, she has a lot of awards. She even has its own little section for it. So she's very accomplished both academically as well as professionally. So overall, very, very strong impressions from the resume. Um, I took some notes just for any recent college grads who are looking to enter the job market. I feel like you can learn a lot from Grace's resume, but also her interview skills um, from her profile, like right away, just from analyzing the resume and probably like 10 to 20 seconds, I pulled away a few things and I wrote them down. Um, student athlete, which I think is definitely unique. There's not a lot of division one college athletes out there. So that already is something unique. Um, like I mentioned, she has a major and a minor and is getting a master's. She highlighted that she's also been on the Dean's list. Um, and it looks like she's doing a bit of a career switch as she's moving from her bioengineering undergrad into computer science. So those are just like some, some quick snippets I'm able to pull from the resume. And I was gonna ask Grace to actually kind of do like a tell me about yourself question to get us started. But since she already knocked that one out of the park and gave you guys a really great template to follow, we can skip over that. But in terms of Grace's story, what I would have recommended, and this is exactly what she did, is try and highlight some of these unique attributes about her background that would separate her from other recent college grads. And as you can tell from her elevator pitch, she hit on basically everything, right? Um, her her experience as a cross-country runner or earning multiple accolades and then all of her different work while going to school. So well done, Grace. No improvements at all there. Thank you. All right, so let me just double check these comments here, see if anyone has any questions before we dive into the meat and potatoes, so they say. Um, Albert says, amazing background. Yeah, Joanne says, go Grace, awesome. Okay, okay, so are you ready to dive into some of these practice questions? I'm ready. Okay, let's do this. Let's start with, so we'll, we'll imagine in an interview that I already asked you the whole tell me about yourself question and then you give me your answer. So Grace, why do you think you'd be a good UX designer here at Facebook? I believe I would be a good UX designer at Facebook because I've been using Facebook as a consumer um, for over 10 years now. So I really have a deep understanding of how 
a, how Facebook is used as a consumer site. I also have my own art business. I know Facebook is really big and right now supporting small businesses. I have my own small business. So I also use Facebook for business. And as from a consumer, like a regular user in a business standpoint, I have a really deep understanding of the customer's perspective of Facebook. And with my skills in design and my background in social media and other heads of platforms too, I believe I would be a great designer for Facebook because I understand the customer and the stakeholders. Great. So I, t I timed it. It was a little bit under a minute, which I think is perfect for some of these, like, I would call them research based questions, which this was what Grace did really, really well here is she tied it. She tied her experience back to what the company does or will will be looking for in the, the role itself, which is good. It obviously shows that she's done some research and she was able to highlight how she actually has tangible experience using the product, which I think is always really, really good as opposed to someone that's just like, oh, I love Facebook. You guys are a great company. But it's but she can actually say, oh, I've used your product. I'm a real customer. Like I've created and built ads for my X, Y, and Z business. Um, that I think is all, all, already going to stand out, which I think not a lot of other people do. Um, what I would have loved for Grace to do a little bit more is highlight more of your technical, tangible skill set that actually can highlight or show that you are a great UX designer as opposed to just an average one. Um, I think you could have gone maybe a little bit longer with that, maybe like add 10 to 15 seconds. Just give me a little bit of a, a of a example, right, of your prowess within UX or UI design, because you do have hands-on experience, which I think is also very unique and something you can add to your story, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and if you're wondering, well, Corey, like what type of example would I possibly share? I mean, I have no UX or UI background, but I mean, they're giving you some stuff here, right? Like um, interaction design work. I don't know what that means, but you can probably talk about something like that. Um, end to end, like you could even use that buzzword, right? End to end, I've done end to end, blah, blah, blah with my product, which has, you know, X thousand views or whatever generated, whatever hundreds of dollars, S some, some tangible quick, synopsis so that someone will easily know that you are technically very, very strong in, in the field. In this right. part, should I highlight my past experiences on kind of completing a project product from end to end and working on all the UI, UX and interaction design? So I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't treat it like a full on behavioral question, like doing the star, like this is what oh. I did, but right, because it's more of a research based question, I would just try and keep it very short and succinct. 10 to 15 seconds, just to highlight an example um, that, yeah, so I wouldn't go like too in depth. Okay, makes sense. Cool. Overall, very strong answer. Very, very strong answer. So. Thank you. Okay. Now I had another question drafted up for you, which was going to be, um, why did you choose to get your master's after um, your inter after completing your internship with Intuitive? But fortunately or unfortunately, you've already answered that. So I guess I won't repeat that question for everyone else at home. So we'll skip that one. Um, okay. So here's an interesting one for you. And let me just double check comments. Let me see if anything new has come through. Nope. Guys, if you do have any questions or um, any thoughts, feel, feel free to put them down in the comments um, below and, and we'll, we'll work through those. Okay, so as we shift back to Grace's resume here, normally um, there are junior internships that people do during their junior summers before entering their senior year. Um, so on your resume, Grace, I didn't know I, I didn't note that you did a junior internship. What did you do during the junior summer? Yeah, during, well, not intern. I worked at Girls Make Games as an artist and camp counselor. So that was kind of my career transition, trying to get more uh, design background on my resume because I tried applying to jobs. However, I didn't have the portfolio skills or the skills needed to apply or like in the, even the industry connections in anything tech, design, or gaming related. So I mostly worked at Girls Make Games, which is a summer camp. So I led, um, I was actually the lead unity counselor. So I taught girls kind of ages 12 to 17, how to make a game using one of the industry standard game engines of Unity, which I previously made a virtual reality game on. And I also mostly worked in the lab at, at Santa Clara University as a virtual reality lab assistant and researcher. So I, I worked with a biology professor, Dr. James Granger, kind of 
talking to him about how to make biology, their biology curriculum at Santa Clara more interactive. So I and him worked together on making biology, biological correct um, molecules in biology. And I kind of coded animations and created those animations in virtual reality for the students. So that's kind of what I did during my transition from bioengineering to more computer science and design. Great. Great, great. Thank now, you. I'm sure no one's going to probably ask a question as direct as I did, but um, I just wanted to make this like a coachable moment for folks who are going to be graduating. Maybe you didn't do any any like notable internship like at a Facebook, Apple, Google, Netflix during your junior summer. Um, as you can tell with Grace's answer, it, it doesn't automatically disqualify you or discount you for a role just because you didn't get an internship at, at one of those companies, right? Um, as long as you can demonstrate that, look, I was doing something besides just playing video games or watching Netflix um, and actually building tangible skill sets, which Grace is able to highlight very, very clearly, she highlighted, look, I was doing a bit of a career switch. I didn't quite have the experience. So in order to go get that, I did two things, right? She was working at Girls at, at Girls Make Games, which gave her the UX, UI exposure, helped her learn Unity, which is definitely going to be like a core component of, of her future role. And she also paired that up by, you know, giving back to Santa Clara University, continuing to build on those skills, which later ended up um, driving into this game here, which I'll highlight, right? So overall, very, very strong answer. Just wanted to highlight that for, for folks at home who maybe want to find a way to explain what you did over a certain summer, if you know it may be um, something that an employer may want to ask you about. So well done, Grace. Thank you. Okay, so now for, in terms of a coachable moment for most entry level roles when you are graduating college and then entering the workforce, the majority of your questions are probably going to be behavioral based. So these are like the tell me about a time or walk me through an example where blah, blah, blah. So they're going to basically have you explain something in your past experience and then make you elaborate and explain how that demonstrates a certain quality or attribute that they are trying to highlight. So because that's how most of these questions will be designed for these uh, college graduate level roles, the majority of the questions that I prepared for Grace are going to be in that fashion. So just keep that in mind for any of those folks who have more experience. You will probably get less of these more hypothetical questions. Okay, Grace, can you tell me about a time when you had to find a creative solution to solve a problem? Yeah, so let me think about it for a second. So I guess what kind of and what what kind of answer what kind of I guess attributes of myself are you trying to look for when asking this question? I'm not sure an interviewer would actually answer this question for you live oh, in a real okay. interview, but uh, to answer your question, um, essentially based on what the, how the question is designed, I'm trying to understand your creative problem solving, um, but also trying to get a little bit of a glimpse of your tech technical background as well, hoping you would pick something from one of your projects or work experience as opposed to something you, you did oh. in class. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so growing up, I've actually loved AP biology in high school. And I realized that um, it's really like the way of learning biology back then was kind of reading from a textbook. It's pretty dry, um, very non-interactive. And I started designing, drawing biology manga. So I drew like all these styles as anime style characters and drew a manga or a comic out of it. Um, and then in college, kind of when I was pre-med and after my pre-med shift to kind of VR, I decided, and I did a lot of research. Um, I also took this social problems in America class and I realized there's this huge gender gap in STEM, especially for women. It's like 70 something percent male and 20 something percent female woman and working in STEM field. So I decided to kind of explore that problem further and see what I can do with my passion for game design and my interest in biology. Um, and I really love biology, especially because I feel like it's a really cool story, how cells interact, it's very fascinating how um, human bodies work and how plants work. So I decided to take um, the social problem of how the gender gap in STEM and decided to combine my comp the background in game design um, and passion in games and drawing to create Selfie, my biology inspired virtual reality game to gamify learning. And through creating Selfie, I was able to teach myself um, through YouTube tutorials online because I unfortunately did not have any mentors at school. However, I was able to learn how to make a game because I joined a lot of Discord communities centered around game design and VR. So I was able to talk to people on the internet and find help to my problems and critique on my work. 
So through creating Selfie, I learned technical skills and using how to code and how to use these VR game engines and also how to teach myself online and reach out for help to communities online, which are not accessible to me in person at school. So it really taught me how to be resourceful and also in, and, and kind of um, help me go further in my technical abilities while while creating creative solution to the problem of the gender gap in STEM and kind of making it fun to learn instead of my experience back in, in high school, learning AP biology and reading from a textbook, I decided it might be fun to make a game to inspire more girls, especially to pursue STEM. Perfect. Thank okay. You. Um, now a follow-up question to that would be, you know, what have others before you tried that didn't work out? And why do you think your solution is so creative or different than what everyone else has done before? Yeah, so I actually look at different games. So another, so in Selfie, the objective of the game is to evolve into a self or evolve into, so start as a star as an organelle, which are the kind of micro organism or, or organ, micro, micro organs by cells, do quest, kill bacteria, little monsters, do quest, evolve into a cell and finally an organism. And there's this other game that was kind of similar. It's called Spore. Um, and you kind of do the evolution pathway, except it wasn't very educational. Um, and then I also looked at other products used in schools, such as Khan Academy, Duolingo, um, kind of how they kind of reward system, reward behaviors, and kind of keep people engaged, especially kids. And I realized kind of Khan Academy, Duolingo, they weren't very immersive. It's kind of very one directional. Um, kind of you just input and you get an output. You get some rewards, you level up, you can share with your friends. However, what I like about kind of Spore is that it's like a 3D game. You can immerse in the environment. And what I like about Khan Academy and Duolingo is it's very educational. So I decided to combine the two, maybe, maybe making like to create an educational, a very immersive um, 3D game where you can interact in and play around, poke around with and see how cells interact in VR, like your cell, like kind of you're inside the cell. And I feel like the best way to kind of learn about something is to try it out yourself. And since we're not all as small as cells, I decided to recreate the environment inside cells in, in, in the virtual reality so I could try it out myself. Okay. Yeah. Great. So we'll end the practice scenario there. Um, overall, I think it's a very, very strong answer. Um, in terms of the S, T, A, and R, the S and T and A were all kind of a little hard to follow, but that's okay. Um, it's not like a hard and set rule that, that, that I tell everyone. Um, it's just a template to essentially keep your thoughts organized so the interviewer can follow along. I was able to track the majority of the story. I mean, it kind of bounced forward and then backwards like once or twice, but then Grace, it, it, like, it, it was still very easy to essentially follow. The problem that she chose to follow, that she chose to highlight and solve in this example was interesting, right? Like most people would, would pick a specific project and then like there was a problem with the project or they ran into some roadblock or some teammate problem and then they had to overcome it in a creative solution. Grace decided to pick something so grandiose and large like <laughs> fixing the gender inequality gap between two, uh, between like bioengineering or whatever. It's, it was an interesting question or an, an interesting approach to, to answer the question. It's also on the flip side though, it's very hard to measure success. And that's something that I think it, it could go either way, depending on like who you're interviewing with and like how they view your answer. Because the one thing that was a little bit lacking was the result of the game itself, right? Like the, the goal was to basically educate or, or make science and bioengineering fun for women which perceivably according to the story you're trying to tell is not very common. So then the result would, would have to be something related to that, right? Like you would need to wrap it up by telling me. And, you know, after I created this virtual reality game, there were, you know, 200 women at Santa Clara in the bio uh, uh, department who eventually used my game and gave me great feedback and told me that, you know, they never thought learning or, or they never thought biology could, could, could be so fun. Um, that I think was really the only thing missing was tying it back to the actual result, back to the problem you were trying to solve, right? I think everything else was, was perfect. She highlighted exactly what I would want to see from someone applying for this role. Talk to me a little bit about your technical skill set, but also a little bit about the soft skills. Uh, she also showed a little bit of UX research as well. She talked about, she looked at 
similar products like from Khan, Khan Academy and the other game called Spore, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I even asked that follow-up question just to kind of like double click down and see how she would react and be able to build on top of her story. And so she did very, very well. So well done, Grace. Thank you. Now, I think I saw in my corner of my eye, the chat moving around a little bit. Let's see. Da -da -da -da. Oh, Alvaro just said, oh, I love Spore. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great um, I guess why don't you touch on the result a little bit right now actually for the viewers at home like what was the result of the project itself from your yeah, VR so, game? yeah so selfie was created during a time of like a major career transition shift it was actually created um, so the concept it started January 2017 when I was kind of um like doing more drawing and kind of designing concept art for my game. I had no idea what my game would be yet. I just drew something like every month that would kind of lead to my game. And a whole development time and learning how to use the game engine which actually took place in about three months um, because I wanted to make it to a showcase. I taught myself how to do 3D modeling, code, and create a game in Unreal Engine to do that. And after doing that, I did a lot of user testing actually. I um, invited a lot of faculty and staff as well as students. And the, the feedback I collected, it was actually qualitative feedback. It's kind of how you felt before and after and how you felt with this element changed, with this element gamified, with this element not gamified. Um, because, and going back in time, I would actually collect metrics. I would actually, I actually timed them too, but I would collect more specific metrics, like how many ATP or the kind of energy currency in my in cells, which is energy currency in games. Like how many ATP did this person collect? How many ATP did this person collect after changing this variable? Um, going back, I'll definitely do more quantitative measures, but for now, what I did is qu all qualitative. And, but I would make it, I actually, this is my first ever project and I definitely have a lot of improvements to go. Very, very cool. Awesome. And I love that, that you touched on like the data aspect, especially as someone moving into the technical, more technical fields. Data is, is, uh, is definitely going to be something something super important that people are going to want to make sure that you're proficient in and are aware of using, especially in your future field. So awesome. Very cool. Very cool. See, so you have anything, any questions? No, not yet. Not yet. You're you're nailing it, Grace. So thank you. We'll keep it going. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. So Grace, have you ever had a different opinion with let's say a coworker or a manager or a teammate before? Hmm. I feel like for me personally, I I I usually because I'm so early in my career, I only had one industry experience. I mostly just agree because I'm kind of, since I'm so new, I don't want anything to backfire on me if I speak up. But so I guess an experience I'm too surgical is that my mentor there was actually a software engineer. He was a very awesome person. Um, I guess maybe going back, I shouldn't say awesome. He was a very resourceful mentor, very experienced, very helpful. I'm trying to use less, less words like awesome in my interview. Um, and I also worked with another artist on my team. So during my internship, I worked on a virtual reality game to train surgeons. And from end to end, I created a product as well. Sorry, from concept art to actual user testing and iterating upon that. And throughout that process, I worked with my software engineering mentor. And, and halfway through, one of the artists on the team um, was in a contract position. He, he, he was a really great person too. He really wanted to help me improve my art skills and wanted to be part of my mentorship as well. Um, and then the software, my software engineering mentor didn't really kind of go along, didn't really, I guess, kind of agree with that um, because I feel like there was some conflict of interest in who is gonna be like my main mentor and who is gonna be kind of guiding my direction towards the completion of this product. Um, so there was a kind of clashing that happened. For me, it actually happened right in front of me, right on my desk with other interns. There was a kind of yelling experience. So I was scared. I didn't know what to do. It's my first kind of kind of corporate drama, I saw or so I say. Um, so I just kind of stood there and I just watched um, and trying to think about how would I, how would react. Um, and I think one of them they just stormed out of the room and one of them just went back to his desk. Um, and then my manager really soon after, like 15 minutes after, and my manager and the director of my team um, asked me to do a one-on-one -on -one meeting, really apologizing about the situation. 
um, and kind of seeing how it would the team would go in the future. And my manager also asked me like, what what are your thoughts on this? Um, so I guess at first, for me, um, this internship was supposed to be more software engineering focused. I guess the part I disagreed on was that I was also very interested in working on art skills. And so, because I kind of um, agreed a little bit with the artist, I wanted him to be a little bit involved in my project as well. I spoke with my manager about it and kind of reasoned him, like kind of talked him through, like as me as a designer as well, very interested in design, very, I feel like it would be very beneficial for me personally, for personal and professional growth to work with the artist as well. So I ended up working with both of them and, um, the next day, everything was fine. I, I was able to communicate with them. My manager really helped. My manager and director really helped diffuse the situation. So that was kind of the time where I kind of disagreed of how the structure worked and really spoke up in the time where everyone was kind of at peace and brought up the issue to my manager. Okay. And then my follow-up question was going to be, um, how were you able to kind of talk it out and resolve? But you already hit that one on the head, so I don't have to ask that. So we'll just end the question there. So I think at the very beginning, um, and I think you could even sense that, I feel like that was probably not the strongest way to start off the question um, because most companies, right, and I guess the I should probably back up one step. What do you think the purpose of the question was designed for? Kind of seeing how the, the person, the interviewer responds to conflict. And for me personally, um, I kind of stuttered a bit because I haven't dealt with that many corporate situations. So I can't really explain or be able to really articulate anything, any experience of conflict resolution and debt. So I was kind of stuttering on that, trying to um, bring my memories back and really be able to talk about it the best to my abilities. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. But I also gave you teammate. I said coworker, manager, or teammate, meaning you could pull an example from like a school project, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So would you wanted? Would you have wanted to pick maybe a school project instead, or? do some of those are some of those examples also hard to kind of uh, uh, generate? Some of those examples are pretty hard to generate because for my school project, I mostly dealt with uh, when the time when I had randomly assigned teammates or people who asked to my, my team, they just didn't do work. Um, <laughs> and I just told the professor like um, after multiple instances of trying to get them to respond and turn into something, um, I just told the professor at the end, like this person in his text, I like pulled up text message evidence um, and more <laughs> evidence and also qualitative <laughs> evidence for my teammate and told him what happened. And as a result, their grades were affected because he didn't contribute. Um, so that's kind of the only school example I can think of because generally, I feel like what I have to work on is really standing up for myself more. I'm really easy to let things slide because I really want to avoid conflict with people. So I think in the future, definitely, more situations where I would be more um, kind of out there with my opinion. Got it. And I feel like a lot of people watching or watching the recording later will, will definitely sympathize and kind of understand where you're coming from, especially, you know, I was the same way too, right? It's your first job. You don't want to rock the boat. You just kind of want to nod your head and smile and pretend that, that, that everything is okay. Um, so the reason why I designed this question was kind of to see if the opposite was true, essentially. Um, at companies like Google, Facebook, Apple, um, they do want folks to have an opinion and speak up. Um, they are known more from like, like a bottoms up company as opposed to like a top down. Um, the opposite would be true for a company like Amazon. Um, so it is, you know, contextual, but because we are using Facebook as the example, I think the, they would have wanted an, an answer that was basically kind of the opposite of what you were framing or teeing up at the beginning of your of your response, which is basically someone who is not afraid to speak up, but do it in the appropriate way, which is why my follow up question was how did you go about talking it out and resolving it? Because I feel like that's definitely a very strong soft skill set that I think a lot of these technology companies would want, even from someone who is recently graduating. Now, keep in mind, you are also technically coming in as a graduate student hire. So it's going to be slightly higher of a bar than just someone who only has a undergraduate degree. So there, there will be definitely that type of expectation. In terms of your answer itself, um, I think the S, the situation and the task part was a little too long. There was a lot of extra details in there that I didn't necessarily really need. And it was also very hard for me to understand how you were going to answer the question. Right, because the question was, um, tell me about a time when you had a different opinion with someone and how did you 
resolve it essentially it took you almost three minutes to tell me what your opinion that, that was differing was and it wasn't really a conflict right it was basically like you thought you should be you thought you should have two mentors your manager thought you should just have one and you were like no i want to and then the director fi fixed it right so um i think just getting to that would have been a little bit better for me and also clearly articulating what the conflict essentially would have been but overall rest of the answer very very strong and i'm glad that you pulled tried to pull something from your work as opposed to just school i think that's also a really good instinct that a lot of people tend to overlook and they fall back on like because uh, honestly like when you interview people who are recent college grads that project example that you talked about right where basically you were in a project and someone didn't do any work that's something that everyone always uses as an example and so because you do highlight so much work experience i'm very very glad that you didn't fall back on a school project example so I have a quick question about that, actually. Would it be possible to give like a social example? Because I manage so many communities online. I could talk about a conflict I had and a disagreement I had with people, kind of like non-academic, non-work related situation. Um, I think, I mean, in an ideal world, if you could have an example that was related to your future job or role or in like a corporate setting, I think those always carry more weight than something that's totally unrelated, right? Um, just to, just to give an example, I'm not, and this is probably not what you were going to say, right? But but just to give you an example, right? If you were like, oh, yes, there was a time where I was walking my dog and this person was very rude to me because I wanted to cross the street with my dog, but they didn't want our dogs to be next to each other. So this is how I resolved the situation, right? So as, as you can tell, right, like, yes, you did answer the question. You gave me an example of a time when you had to resolve a conflict, and I'm sure it was very scary. Maybe it was a pit bull or something, and you, you're, you're afraid of dogs or whatever, but in that context, it doesn't really highlight some skill set or, or put you in an environment where they're like, oh, I can see how this would be relevant to, to Facebook. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's see. Anything in here? How is Grace doing? Let us know your thoughts. Thanks for hosting. Okay. Yeah. We'll keep it going. Grace, you're doing great. Thank you. You are doing great. Okay. So, I'm going to mix things up here a bit and I'm going to give you a different style of question because I feel like you are ready for it. So Grace, imagine I hired you in this product designer role, which I'll throw back up on the screen here. So you already got the job. Congratulations. I hired you. Welcome to Facebook. Now, imagine I hired you and you are assigned to be the product designer for our Facebook Live product, which we are using right now. So, um, and so you've just joined their team as their newest designer. Tell me, what are two changes or recommendations you would suggest for the Facebook Live application or product itself? Yeah, so first I would ask the question to my manager, what is the custom, what is the business goal of making changes to the Facebook Live? And then kind of, kind of doing a lot of user research and then kind of really pinpointing down the problem I'm trying to solve, which will help me design a solution for Facebook Live. Okay, let's just say you do that research already. Okay, I just want you to be very creative and tell me what are two changes you would make. So personally for me, I haven't used Facebook Live before. Um, I've used it once in a virtual reality setting, actually. I was actually using Facebook Spaces and going live on there. Um, and going back to that experience, I, I'd like to highlight what I like about it first. So. I really like how you're able to see the comments in VR in real time and be able to react for it. And since going live right now, um, I have to kind of click back to my window to see the comments. I would maybe add a way where you can kind of see the comments as notifications on the desktop screen. Kind of this is, this is based on my own personal experience right now on Facebook Live, like highlighting comments on like the top right where your notifications are to, um, to make sure like I, I see everything. Um, uh, but for the customer's perspective, to kind of narrow down the problem further, I would definitely do a lot of interviews because because doing design problems is not just about myself, but it's about um, the user and because the company needs to be able to design solutions to um, kind of to help our different users and improve their experience to generate more revenue. So definitely do more user research interviews. But for now, from my uh, limited experience, I can say notifications um, and and live reactions too. I know it's on, on Twitch, you can see the little emojis floating in the air, kind of like floating up. And I feel like that's a level of engagement 
um, that can be cool as well. Okay, so you had two recommendations, right? Um, notifications and live reactions. So for those two recommendations or changes, um, how would you solicit feedback or work with other product designers, UX designers, engineers within your Facebook team um, to build or, I guess, plan and design these these new features? Yeah, so first I'll kind of go over the problem, bring up the problem to my product manager, um, which will probably, if it's a problem that needs to be solved, um, that's like a big project, then it, they will probably be the director's input as well. So I'll kind of bring up to higher level, just kind of gain their opinions and insights on it. And after they approve it, I would go to, to my team and kind of facilitate a user research interview to really prove using quantitative data to prove that this is actual problem, like same notifications, like it's like a thing users struggle with. Um, so it's like worth for the company to invest time and money on the problem. And after kind of gaining the results, I would kind of start with a brainstorming session. Um, for my process of designing, I usually start with like, how might we, like I usually narrow down the problem, use the research first, kind of narrow down like three different problem areas or as many as possible as I see and narrow it down. Um, and kind of use like a lot of sticky notes of brainstorming session, brainstorm different solutions and collectively as a group, we seeing everyone's input vote on the solution that is the best or kind of a couple of solutions to explore further, kind of maybe three or four different solutions. And then we'll start with low fidelity to high fidelity. We start with low fidelity sketches, which are pencil on paper, just to kind of test it out. Uh, with a very cheap setting, like very low cost setting to, to high fidelity mock-up. So we would kind of draw the solution on paper, discuss it with members of the team, members of the engineering, see if it's feasible, the product management team, the business perspective directors, see if this idea is good to, to kind of spend more time on. And at the game their input, I would convert designs to medium fidelity, kind of on a prototyping app, such as Sketch or Figma, and be able to kind of white box things, kind of lay out, the architecture and information architecture, how the app or how the new interface would look like. And at this point, when the prototype is interactive in a medium fidelity mode, so no colors, no pictures, um, no animations, we would test it out with people in the company or even potential users, um, just do some usability testing to see if the user flow and interactions are useful for the user, see if there's anything in to be improved and get both quantitative and qualitative feedback and see which designs work and which don't and kind of keep improving on there. And after that, after narrowing down what we find, we'll move on to the high fidelity, which is basically the final version. Um, and then we will do some more usability testing, seeing what works, what doesn't, make some small changes, and then launch the product. And Facebook, I noticed that also does a lot of A-B testing. So we test with the variable and without the variable. So after it's launched, we would kind of have one set of users seeing the notifications and seeing their engagement rate, um, seeing the it will measure the time, the engagement rate by the time, that how many times they live stream, how long do they live stream for when seeing these notifications versus not seeing notifications and seeing how long they live stream for and how many reactions they get and kind of test on there um, and kind of continue making improvements by A-B testing and a lot of feedback and just keep getting insights from the user to keep improving the product. Okay. Now let's just say everyone thinks that, that that your two feature requests are great ideas, except there's one engineering partner that you really need in order to get this project done, and they're just not convinced that it's the right move. How would you convince that person to help you add these features? Yeah, so first bring up the problem, like users are missing, like a lot of streamers on Facebook Live are, are missing comments they see and are not answering their um viewers question. So I'll like kind of explain um, the importance of the, to the user and also how much more revenue Facebook will bring in from design notifications and kind of explain like the how the solution will positively impact the user's experience and the business aspect of Facebook and trying to convince the engineer and also show, present him my user research data, kind of back it up with both qualitative and quantitative feedback to help convince him to work on the project. Okay, now now let's say he's like, you know what, Grace, I'm working on six other feature requests right now, and I just don't feel like yours is is really a high priority for me, and I, and I don't think I, I have time for it right now. How would you respond then? I would say the other designers are also on board with this. Um, I would also ask him just to kind of understand his point of view and his reasoning why he's 
um, prioritizing other projects and kind of gauge from there. Like, what if he's fixing a bug that's impacting a billion users right now? Then I would kind of scale back and maybe reschedule that design project to later because it's a it's like a teamwork. Like you have like these engineers work on other projects as well, and sometimes different projects like oh this is bugs that some people can't access their account. Like that's like a bug uh, where people are locked out. Like these are it's a very urgent bug that which will impact Facebook business drastically because they lose a lot of ad revenue when people can't use Facebook. So I'll let him or let her, the engineer, adjust it first and then um, kind of go from there. So kind of understand the, the engineer's projects and like the priorities and kind of scale down and respond based on that. Well done. Well, well done. There we go. That was Thank a you. phenomenal <laughs> answer. And I made it Thank hard you. on purpose. You could tell the, the that I that like I purposely saved this one kind of for the end as you got warmed up. Um, yeah, I I I don't know if you'll get that many follow up questions, but I just kind of wanted to probe and see how you would handle it, but also give folks at home like a really great insight as to how you would essentially continue on with your answer as it keeps building, which is very common for hypothetical questions, right? You you give them one answer and you think, oh great, I answer the question, it's done. But then but then there's going to be a follow up question where you're going to be like, oh okay let me you know expand on that idea some more and then they're going to change a variable right like in this case i was like well imagine you have everyone's buy-in except for one person tell me how you would you know resolve that so this was a really cleverly designed question if i do pat myself on the back here um because i wanted to both test your technical capabilities and you walked me through basically the entire pro like pro product life cycle or design process design process essentially. Uh, but I also wanted to test your soft skills, right? Which at any large tech company, it's highly matrixed, meaning you'll be working with a lot of different stakeholders, all of which who don't report to you. So you'll basically need to convince people to help you with your projects when they have other stuff to do. So that's what I was essentially trying to get at. And Grace hit pretty much everything right on the head. It was really, really strong. Very, very good answer. Thank you. Um, if you were looking for any type of constructive criticism and I do think you would probably be able to get away with it based on how you answered overall I think you probably could have shortened your response to the whole like product life cycle piece itself like I didn't need to I didn't need to have you define me like all the different terms and like you're gonna basically like build something get get feedback go back edit it build something come back edit it and then release and then but you're gonna do two different versions like you could have done that maybe in like you could have gave me that synopsis and probably about 60 percent of the time um, but other than that, I think it was a very, very strong answer. Thank you. Well done. All right, Brian HK Lee, I love it. Um, also solicit and ask the engineer, what do you think is missing to make this happen? Love it. Very good, very, very cool. All right, guys, we are wrapping up. I think we I only have one question left. So if you guys do have questions that you want us to cover or you're just curious about when you're interviewing, put them down in the chat and uh, we'll check. So this is our very last practice question. OK. Are you ready? Yeah. So Grace, there's quite a lot of accomplishments that you've listed here on your resume, both your experience and awards and leadership positions that you've highlighted. Which of your accomplishments would you say are you most proud of and why? Um, is it okay to ask for a few few seconds, few moments to think about it? Mm -hmm. I'll have a few moments, few seconds to think about it. Okay, so I'm ready. Um, so for me, um, the most proudest accomplishments I have in my award section is actually getting the, the James W. Reitz School of Engineering Award. Um, so this award, there's multiple senior awards and this award is only given to one senior of the graduating class and I was able to get it. Um, so for me, um, talking a little personal aspects of myself, in high school, I was always told to take the easy classes to get a good GPA. And so going into college, engineering was very hard for me because I was used to take, taking the easier classes and I struggled with um, kind of keeping up with my classes. And I thought I could never really make it as an engineer because everything was really hard for me. Um, so I decided to work really hard, go to a lot of office hours and really kind of fill in the gaps of my knowledge and be able to become do really great work in school in class and also um, kind of in the 
social perspective. So I also saw a leader of a bunch of clubs, uh, ran across country and track, was really involved in research and also journalism and my own projects as well. And through my involvement in school, I was able to really kind of try out everything and know my limits and be able to work really hard and create really positive spaces for people through the clubs I was involved in, uh, which led me to get this award. So this is like a faculty nominated award um, that I was able to get. And I would never known that I was able to be able to do engineering because I struggled a lot so much in the beginning. I thought of just dropping out and like doing um, something that I thought might be easier, like for me at that time, maybe like something less technical, like art or public health, um, because engineering math was super hard for me, but I was able to push through and uh, put in a lot of effort studying and also um, really a lot of volunteer community to be able to make this award happen. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so basically what this question was essentially the designed to do was to just kind of put you in, a, in an uncomfortable spot. Also, I wanted to see how, well, I guess the, the, the interviewer would want to see how you're able to identify like an accomplishment, but also turn it into like a, a basically a situation that's not all about yourself, right? Like if, if you had picked something that was super individual or or, sell, or somewhat selfish, right? At certain companies that may be kind of a a red flag, right? Where it's like, well, would she share credit if we were working on like a large project? Or, you know, how would I enjoy working with her knowing that, you know, this is how she gets her energy, for example. So I think I and at the end, you kind of touched on how it was like a community effort, and it was faculty nominated. And so that was re really, really great. My only advice here would be, I don't think you should ask for time before you answer this question because it should be relatively easy, right? It's like if I asked you, why do you want to work at Facebook? And you're like, can I get two seconds to think about why I want to work at Facebook? And they'd be like, yes, <laughs> you can have a few <laughs> seconds to think about it, right? Um, not that this is the same thing, but it's like if you have to talk about yourself, right, and pick an accomplishment, it should kind of be somewhat pretty quick, right? You can stall a little bit, right? You can be like, Oh, okay. Well, you know, um, thinking between, you know, my awards and my experience, I think I would choose, right? So already I bought like that buys like five seconds, right? But I wouldn't go, oh, can I get, you know, some time to think about which of my many accomplishments I'm so proud of? Um, that's the, the only thing I would try and work on for next time is for these like somewhat softball questions, just to be sure you're, you're, you're ready to go or find like more creative ways to stall while you're mm -hmm. thinking, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So that is pretty much all of the questions I wanted to cover. I didn't dive into any of the technical, like, not coding, but like UX the design questions that you would probably get just because for a general audience, not everyone would find that to be super helpful. So I'm sure she's already preparing for a lot of that stuff. Um, Albert says, what about the basic entry level questions like her biggest strength and weaknesses? I think you'd kill it. Well, do you want to give one of those a try? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, um, try. Well, I'm not going to give you those because like I already teed them up. And so, and plus I feel like you'd crush it. So I'm going to give you like a harder version of okay. that. Um, what was your most recent failure? My most recent failure. Should I, a really quick question. Um, should this be kind of something in a school setting or like in a work setting or a professional setting in any way? Are you asking me as an interviewer or are you asking me as like someone who's giving you? As an interviewer. Oh, you can pick. I'm oh, asking for okay. your most okay. recent failure. Yes, yes. So for me personally, the reason why I'm stuttering is because I generally tend to not focus on uh, failures. I decide to like focus on what I learned from it. Um, I guess, so I actually, I don't consider this a failure because I learned from it as well. I actually learned a lot of things from this. Um, well, I'm thinking of whether I should use this down because this question is very interesting. Um, so it I'm is, which is why I picked here, it. Like you said. <laughs> Yeah, this is very, very interesting because when I think of failure, um, what people usually say is like, oh, I didn't get this job, which I do have a story for that. But I feel like as an entry level designer, 
like intervene for the entry level level at a company like Facebook, where I'm competing a lot with a lot of people, I probably shouldn't give that example. So that's like the one example I think of my head. So I'm trying to dig a little deeper in my mind to see if I can give another one. I guess my most recent failure comes from community management, actually. So I like to create a lot of Discord servers. So um, I really love, uh, I used to play this game called Maple Story Mobile. I, growing up, I also played Maple Story. Um, so it gives all context about how Maple Story particular relates to this, is relevant to this, is that in, when I was 14 years old, I was a guild leader for one of the top guilds on Maple Story, and I was, I was max level in the game. So I have a lot of experience in Maple Story. Um, and this last summer, I decided to create a community on Discord. Uh, based on Maple Story, kind of just gather Maple Story players all over the round to kind of get to know each other and socialize. And with, during the creation of this server, the first week, over 200 members joined. And because these people on Discord, the use of it's, it, you can be very anonymous on Discord because you can't use your real name. There's going to be people from all different backgrounds and different perspectives and different attitudes towards things in life. Um, so you get, you get a lot of opinions, a lot of clashes of people. So me as a community manager, I, I witnessed somebody say something transphobic towards someone who was trans, transgender in the Discord server. It really affected um, them and really emotionally. And he left the server, also got a lot of people to be really angry at me, the community creator for not addressing this, even though I was at work. So I didn't respond in about three hours, which is probably like, a weeks in like Discord community time. <laughs> so I, 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 after work, I saw my phone, like 500 messages and I was kind of in shock. I didn't really know what to do. So I started just kind of reading through and talking to people to some, talking to my other admins in the server because I had other admins to help me out because this huge, huge server and just kind of get the context of what's going on. And once I understand what's going on right now in the moment versus in three hours ago, because that could be like a few days in Discord time, um, I really got to understand like what's happening right now. And I was just like, able to solve it, communicate with the people who are reaching out to me, the, the most urgent messages. And kind of when I had more time back read through everything. So because that person was said a transphobic comment um, that a lot of people were really mad for me for not doing that or moderating that. Um, so I decided collectively with the other admins on my server and decided to remove him from the server. And by removing him, another whole crowd of different people came with you know, those different perspectives, people over the world, they said that this is not a strong, this is like not a bannable offense. Like saying something transphobic, it should, it's not fine. These people are weak for thinking that way. Like if you're a weak leader, like why, who are you for like taking him away? Like what he said, he should stay and, and stuff. So I was dealing with half the people who said, yeah, what the transphobic person who made the transphobic comment should leave. And like the other half said, you're, you're like a weak leader. Like you shouldn't like ban people for like that. So I was trying to really balance both perspectives and trying to get them to calm down um, because I, I, there's a lot of stakes involved in this. I was, I was also like during the middle of my internship last summer into the surgical. Um, so I was able to really communicate with both sides. I was able to educate the people who kind of rebelled against me uh, for saying, yeah, that's not a bad offense, but I said that this is because this person was emotionally affected and the purpose of this community is to make this community as safe as possible. Um, so I kind of was discussed with them. So. Uh, we all came to mutual agreement, so that solution was solved. All right, good. And <laughs> I think I think just to appease Albert, uh, because he's 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 probably very curious, and and I am as well. Um, what is your greatest weakness? My greatest weakness. Um, I tend to not. I tend to try try to work on them, and I feel like my greatest weakness is I tend to take on a. I feel like this is kind of generic, but I try to take. I take on too much sometimes than I can actually handle, but I'm working on it. Being able to say no to things that I don't think I could meet. Um, and I guess my other greatest weakness is sometimes I ramble a lot because I have all the things in my mind. So I guess what I'm trying to do is be able to do more mock interviews and be able to polish my story and polish my answers and seeing, getting feedback and trying to improve and cut down um my storytelling because right now i'm rambling again so yeah so um kind of taking out too much and rambling but i'm working on it okay very good um so uh, real quick on the weaknesses question um you should give them or show that i should say not not give them 
excuse me, show them how you are working to improve on them. Um, I think you were trying to hint that by saying, by doing mock interviews, but basically you should just call out like, I understand that this is a weakness of mine to fix it. I am doing X, Y, and Z things. For example, I'm putting myself in front of a hundred different strangers on a large Facebook group doing a mock interview session to get live coaching from a career coach um, about my interviewing skills. And hopefully through that experience, I will be able to practice speaking in a more concise manner. Uh, and other than that, um, Beatrice Lee says, what does UX mean to you? Yeah, UX user experience. So um, I guess coming from like, a, I'm going to dive a little deep into why I'm interested in UX for social media specifically, kind of not something I, I'm not sure. I, I need a feedback on this. Like, I'm not sure if this is good to bring up during an interview, but in school, middle school, actually, I was bullied a lot online, on Facebook particularly. And I feel like nowadays, these kids, these generation um, are faced with a lot of online bullying on social media, especially during quarantine. Um, kind of like kids have moved their bullying from in-person to online. So I really feel like the user experience of the product, user experience can mean a lot. Like it can educate people, it can help people think differently. It can help nudge people into making like the kind, like the better decision. So I really feel like UX is really important, um, especially in our younger generation and for everyone as well, um, to be able to design products that to let, like create positive social impact. So I really passionate about working in social media because I feel like uh, with UX and working in that field, I can educate people to prevent um, kind of situations where like I was bullied online again to like, the younger generation today. Okay. And then Beatrice also asks, what is your experience with doing research meth methods, I think? Um, what is your experience with doing research methods and how comfortable are you doing them? Yeah, so generally I, like for me, I know research research is very important. For me, I currently do um, a lot of interviews with people, with the users and stakeholders trying to figure out their pain points. So I ask them like, what do you like about this product? What makes you want to delete this app? Or like, can you rank the features from most memorable to least memorable? Or like most important to least important? To kind of figure out how they think and what they prioritize of things. Um, on top of the qualitative data, I would also create collect quantitative data, like sending out surveys and forms. I do that really often, so I share my surveys a lot on group chats. Um, so I kind of create like metrics, like both qualitative, like the quotes from customers or stakeholders and quantitative data, like how how pain they feel when like experiencing this or um, like kind of how they feel about different things and how much time they spend on something to really use this data for user research. I try to collect data through interviews and surveys, quantitative and qualitative and quantitatively to try to back up my decisions to potential investors and people um, all across the stakeholder board. Perfect, great. Thank you. All right, Albert, I think we, we made it through all of the questions and comments on the chat. Sounds good, sounds good. Um, and really impressive, Grace, I think that- Thank you. When yes, I definitely got to give a, a round of applause. Well done, Grace. Thank you. I think of myself two months before graduation in 2010, and I felt really entitled to wanting a job, whereas you've already created that impact and you know exactly what you're doing and what you want to do and why. And that's what actually makes it really impressive. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Corey. I appreciate your time as always tonight. And thank you, Grace, as well. It definitely takes guts to come online and do this. And you have definitely a lot of bravery to do so. And I think you definitely blew a lot of people away tonight with your demeanor and your experience and your ability to articulate everything. I'm gonna say we had several hundred people come through in total at the very end of the evening, which is really great. For those of you who are watching right now, if you wanna be in the next video, uh, message me at albert at ajobslist.com. Uh, we definitely love to have you on this for next week. And I'll be reaching out to some of you who probably did watch tonight and see what your thoughts are. Uh, with the continuation of COVID-19, we invite you to join us for some of our other upcoming webinars. Tomorrow, we'll be chatting with April Starlight about how to work with a recruiter. And on Wednesday, you'll want to join us with your LinkedIn profile in hand so you can get noticed for your next opportunity. Before then, we'll see you in the community with your success stories, your introductions, and your advice posts. 
uh, we'll get through this together. And you know what, as always, may luck be in your favor and peace be on your mind. Good night and thanks everybody. And we'll see you all soon.